Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Our guest today is Chris Triolo, the VP of Customer Success for Respond Software. He and I are going to talk about the top five soft skills and why they are just as critical as technical aptitude when preparing for a career in cybersecurity. The shortage of cybersecurity professionals around the globe has never been more acute. Research by ISC Squared places the estimate at just under 3 million, with roughly 500,000 of those positions located in North America. Couple this with the continued explosion of threats and the industry is in dire need of support. The government has also taken note of this need and in response developed the Federal Cybersecurity Reskilling Academy. With this program, federal employees can gain hands-on training in cybersecurity, one of the fastest growing fields in the country. The reskilling effort is part of the administration's commitment to develop a federal workforce of the 21st century, as outlined in the president's management agenda and the recent government reform plan. A federal re uh, cybersecurity reskilling academy exhibited several valuable soft skills that made them rise above the immense number of applicants during the interview process, including communication and collaboration, analytical mindset, keen understanding of human behavior, research and writing experience and curiosity and creativity. And we're going to talk to Chris about all of these. Chris, thank you very much for being, being here today. Thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, so to start at the very beginning, let's, uh, we always like to ask our guests, uh, how and when did you first get in, started in computers and security and why? Yeah, so um, it goes back to about uh, 1997, uh, 98. It's been okay. uh, more than 20 years at this point. Yep. Um, you know, it really started for me. I was uh, I got a position as a temp as an office manager at a, a defense contractor. Okay. Um, and so basically, I was a I was a front desk person, and you know there wasn't a lot for me to do in in that job, but I did have a computer in front of me with mm -hmm. uh, internet access, and so I took advantage of that. Right, it was mm -hmm. there, and I and I started using it um, and started learning. You know, essentially teaching myself. But what was cool is that this was a, I was working for a company that this was their a satellite office for them. And the, the locals needed IT help and there was no IT person there. Okay. So I started helping them. I <laughs> learned, you know, networking, how to get them on the network, how to configure their email clients, how to, you know, get access to file shares and, and this kind of thing. Um, and it was great. You know, I learned it. I was helpful to them. They made me uh, permanent, right? I, I went from attempt to a, a permanent position. Yep. Um, but where things got really interesting for me is uh, my, one of my bosses came to me one day and said, uh, I think I've got a position for you. I want to put you out at the at Shriver Air Force Base. Uh, it, it was in Colorado Springs at the time mm -hmm. um, to do uh, information assurance, IA. And uh, I, I didn't even know what IA was, right? I mean, that, right. that's what the DOD calls information security, right? Yep. Uh, and I said, but you know, I don't know what this is, right? And he said, don't worry, you're going to learn because you have the right aptitude. You're the kind of guy who can pick this stuff up real quick and we're going to send you the training and things like that. And so that's, that's basically, you know, how it began. Um, they had a political situation going on out there that they thought my soft skills were going to be really helpful for. Mm -hmm. And that's where I first started seeing how soft skills and, you know, a career in information security actually tie together really well. Okay. So, yeah, let's jump back to that first position when you were, you were the temp and you, you just sort of learned how to get people onto the network and get people onboarded and stuff. Like, where did you... What was it just like trial and error? Were you just like running and grabbing books out of the library? Like what, you know, how did you sort of like ramp yourself up very quickly that way? I mean, it was, it was probably a combination of three things. One was, was books. Mm -hmm. Like literally that was the time where most of the information was still being printed in books that you'd go to Barnes and Noble <laughs> and take off the bookshelf. All information um, was available in four dummies form. <laughs> It's uh, yeah, exactly. Right. And I mean, and don't kid, right. That, that yeah. was actually a really useful book because sure. they, you know, they got right to the point in, in those books. So that was really probably the major source um, in that position too. As I said, I was working with the IT department that was based back on the East coast. And so I would reach out to them for help and explanations at time times. And then, you know, there was some stuff available on the internet, but it was a lot of trial and error. It's about having those pieces of hardware, you know, in your hands to 
PCM CIA cards, right? Which is mm-hmm. the things you plug into a laptop and then yep. have a dongle. And, you know, so you'd have this equipment in front of you and you just practice with it and play with it. And the combination of that, um, you know, really gets you, you know, gets you there. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, real quickly, just turning to uh, career things. What is your, your day-to-day work at, as VP of customer success for Respond Software look like? What is your average day in terms of projects or hours or expectations from clients, things like that? Yeah. So, you know, right now, the, the, the primary goal uh, for, for, for me or for my uh, team is to get customers up and running on our software, to get them, you know, trained up, understanding how to use it, making sure that it's providing, you know, the value that, that you know, we set out to provide uh, when we sold them the product. Um, but we are a, a relatively new company. So we're, you know, three, three and a half years old at this point. And so, you know, essentially that startup situation where, you know, a lot of the back end processes and tools and um, procedures have to, you know, be developed. So we're still, you know, spend a lot of time, you know, developing those. And now it's more refining them. You know, have a lot of that in place. But um, as we're actually in real world scenarios, we start to see, okay, we got to make improvements and changes here. So we, we spend a lot of time doing that. Um, but uh, the other thing would be, you know, as a startup, every executive in the company really has a, a sales responsibility is to talk to customers and explain to them, you know, what our software does, what the value is and things like that. And people like me are actually, you know, uniquely qualified to have that kind of conversation Mm. because I've got this background with technical security. Um, I was that practitioner, you know, I learned Mm -hmm. all that time ago and then, you know, bringing that forward um, and being able to explain the products uh, from a technical perspective, but also from a business value perspective. And so, you know, it ends up being uh, quite a bit of time doing that these days. Okay. And you're also a security evangelist for the company as well. Is that right? Yeah. And you know, that usually finds its way in the form of conferences, you know, speaking yep. engagements yep. where we're, you know, explaining to customers typically, you know, what, what are these challenges in security? This one that we're discussing today being one of the major ones, you know, the skills gap, you know, shortage of people and uh, you know, what to do about it. Yeah. So what is, what is the sort of ratio between, I mean, I don't know if you, if you sort of divvy it up between your VP hat and your evangelist hat, but what is the, the ratio in the average day between doing this or doing that? Or is it all kind of fluid? It's pretty fluid, but I would just say in general, it's 80, 20, 80% of the time I'm really focused on, you know, running the, the, the customer success team and 20% maybe out on the road doing conference talks and things. Gotcha. Uh, so the focus of today's episode, uh, obviously, is the issues behind and some solutions to uh, possibly the cybersecurity skills gap. So let's start with the root causes. Uh, we noted in the intro that skills gap between qualified cybersecurity professionals and jobs that need them is estimated at just under 3 million with roughly 500,000 of those positions located in North America. So to start things right off, well, big picture stuff, what is the biggest cause of the skills gap in your opinion? You know, I, I think the digital economy has grown so fast that we just can't keep up with it. Right. Mm-hmm. That yeah. the tech adoption has been so fast that, you know, the size and scope of the problem of the data that we have to process and manage, it's just exploded. It's gone exponentially. And, you know, the human population is not, not caught up with it. Right. And I think that is probably, you know, the primary reason you hear all about, you know, the number of connected devices. Everybody's, you know, digitizing their operations. And although, I mean, you, you know, you've got that IT focus, but what about the security focus, right? And it tended to be an afterthought, I think, and, you know, things of that nature. And it ended up creating uh, this gap. And, and honestly, it's, it, I don't even know if we could catch up to it at this point. Right. There's, there's only mitigating at this point or, you know, triaging, I guess. Um, so, uh, in our intro, we talked about the federal cybersecurity reskilling agency. What is this? When was it founded and, and what are not only its concrete goals, but it, the methods it's using to try and achieve them? Yeah. So the office of management and budget actually hatched this, um, last, uh, it was November, 2018 okay. when they announced that they were, you know, going to do this program and, what it, what's so interesting about it is, is they decided they were going to pull people from other federal jobs that would actually apply for this thing. 
and teach them cybersecurity skills, right? Okay. En enough to actually operate or you know act as a security analyst. Hmm. But they weren't going to draw from all your traditional IT type jobs, you know, the ones that you'd expect that you'd right. be, you know, getting getting people from. And that's pretty innovative. And I think it's, you know, for a certain, you know, one reason, of course, is just the shortage. So, you know, as maybe a bit of a science experiment, can you pull people from traditionally non, you know, tech IT jobs and make them effective in, right. in this way? But what they did is they hooked up with SANS Institute, which is, you know, going back to my first story, the first training I ever went to was SANS back 20 years ago. I mean, that's where I got the best and most training for uh, cybersecurity at that time. Um, so they worked with them and, you know, they developed this, this curriculum. But the first thing that they developed is this on, online assessment. And what the point was, was to see if they could test whether or not people had the right soft skills, um, problem solving skills, these kinds of things to make them, you know, probably uh, have a good chance of being success successful in, you know, in the uh, cybersecurity area. Right. Okay. And so that's yeah. kind of where they started. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, I guess the idea is that you already have, you know, the, the IT area is, is under understaffed enough as it is. So why not, why, why not get security folks from, from other areas that might, might be able to sort of endure it a little better. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, the approach is, you know, kind of typical to how SANS does things. There's, you know, classroom training and online training and things like that. But, you know, then they move to, um, you know, certification, taking tests, and then it's, um, you know, hands-on practical experience. And I think this is the real key of how it actually becomes real is you could do a lot of that, you know, sort of book learning, but it's when you put hands to keyboard, when you actually have to solve the problems that the, the concepts start connecting, you start building that skill set. Okay. So um, moving into the sort of meat of the matter, the Federal Cybersecurity Reskilling Agency has identified these five invaluable soft skills uh, that set potential cybersecurity professionals applying for jobs apart from the pack. So I'm hoping we can kind of go through them point by point. I have questions for you on each of the five, if that's okay. Yep. Uh, so first we have communication and collaboration. So what, is, what does that mean sort of empirically and how does one display communication and collaboration skills in one's resume or interview? Sort of how do you sort of enhance that in your, in your, work, in your work skills? Yeah, you know, I, I, I like to say that security is a team sport, right? You're, you're rarely doing it alone. I mean, you may be doing some research project by yourself, but ultimately you're, you're working in a team environment and that expands beyond just the security group that goes into the IT group and maybe other groups, even like, um, you know, human resources and legal and PR, you know, if you have any kind of breach situation, uh, those groups are uh, others that would be involved. So having a ability to communicate well and to collaborate with others is a very important skill set in terms of, you know, doing effective cybersecurity you know, in, in any of these organizations. Um, you know, if, if I'm talking to a prospect, you know, somebody I'm interviewing, what, I, what I'm basically asking for is to, for them to provide examples where, yeah. uh, you know, they've, you know, give me situations where you've been collaborating with your peers or you've had to communicate on a broader spectrum or, you know, that kind of thing to assess how I, I feel that they're, you know, uh, what their skill set is in that area. Yeah, yeah. What are What are some of the sort of, uh, shall we say, uh, green lights or whatever, if, if you, what, what are some things you like to hear in an interview uh, that, that indicate that someone's strong in this area? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I think about is uh, it, security and security people that we, we tend to be, we have sort of a perfectionist sort of attitude, right? And, you know, we want everything to be secure and we want you to do everything the right way. And, and, it's, you know, at times, you know, you kind of lose that idea of, well, you can only ask users to do so much, right? It's user right. acceptability and, and, and things of that nature. And so there's this, there's this uh, you know, the better approach is to, to figure out how to sort of influence, right? How do you influence people to uh, do what you want them to do from a security perspective uh, without getting, you know, getting them upset? So mm -hmm. it's those kinds of things that you're looking for, like for people's ability to influence, to be able to, um, 
you know, they may not have the authority uh, to, to get something done, but they're able to get people to move in a direction uh, even without that authority. Gotcha. Okay. So let, let's talk next about analytical mindset. I, I feel like this probably is the most sort of intuitive in, ter- in terms of being able to see like, okay, I can see where this would be right. useful specifically for uh, security. Um, but how does one, would you say, develop this sort of skill? Are there methods or techniques that you would use to sort of develop an analytical mindset? Are there things you can do in your day-to-day job that will increase it or... Yeah, so you know, there's quite quite a bit of things that you could do. You know, I, I think about how when we train uh, security analysts, um, you know, over the years, I've I've had a lot of opportunities to do that. And you know, one of the things that we ask them to do is to write write research reports. Um, we give them a you know, for example, a, a breach or a compromise, and say, explain what happened. Mm. And this gets people to essentially do two things: they externalize which means, you know, write it down and then they reduce, they break down the problem into parts and then explain, you know, what's, what's happened in these. And when you get people to do that exercise, you can see how, you know, they start developing these, these analytical skills, right? Yeah. Yeah, Now, um, is that the sort of thing you would recommend uh, people looking for a new job that they would sort of maybe write something out like that in a, you know, cover letter or sort of like find a way to sort of let the, the gatekeepers see an example of it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you've got the opportunity to do that thing, uh, you know, to, to write something, I don't know, it may sound crazy, but yeah, do it, write it, mm-hmm. publish, publish something if you can. Right. When you, when you get a, a SAN certification, you know, they will make you do that, you know, write this research paper at the end. That is something that I've seen a lot of people use to, uh, you know, when they bring to employers and say, hey, look, here's, here's the research paper I wrote. It's actually a really effective way, you know, for, uh, you know, the, somebody who's hiring to see that you've demonstrated, you know, the, uh, this analytical skill set. Um, one cool website that I'll just have to mention is uh, clear, clearerthinking.org. Oh, okay. And go to that. And it's, it's got just tons of resources to, for uh, to help you understand, you know, what is this analytical mindset and how to develop it and how to, how to think about it. Um, you know, the other thing that we, we talk about doing too is, is um, domain transfer, is to okay. think about, you know, um, how to apply concepts and strategies from one domain to the other, right? Most obvious in our industry is military, like looking okay. at, you know, examples of how m- military strategy can be applied to your cyber strategy, you know, but uh, healthcare is another one that you'll see okay. being used a lot. You know, this idea of developing immunities and, you know, that kind of thing. How do you, you know, get your networks healthy? You know, we, we yes. use that analogy a lot. And right. so, you know, but it, it's it good, it's good and it works and it really helps, uh, I think, develop that analytical mindset. Okay. And remind me of the name of the site again, Clear Thinking, Clear Mindset, was it? Clearerthinking.org. Clearerthinking.org. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, um, jumping to the next one, when you say keen understanding of human behavior, I mean, that sounds to me like something that's innate to certain people and less so to others. Uh, is that a, a skill that can be developed, understanding human behavior? So, I, you know, I'm going to tend to agree with you that mm-hmm. it's innate in certain people. You know, we're talking right. about EQ here, right? Emotional yeah. intelligence. And right. people who have that, um, you know, you tend to see it's it's you know, you kind of have it or you don't, but I do think you can learn in this area, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it can be studied, right? Criminology is a good example, right? I mean, you can study criminology and understand how criminals work, how they think. Um, and then you start to see, uh, you know, humans are very repeatable. They do the same things over and over and over, right? So once you start to understand their motivations, um, you can apply that. So I, I do think you, you do learn over time. But, you know, I would love the person, if I were hiring, right, that has that, you know, that innate emotional intelligence. Okay. So um, jumping on to point four here, research and writing experience, uh, you know, it's, it's less hard to define and easier to know how to develop. But, you know, even that I'd like to sort of jump, you know, get your opinions on this. How would you suggest that uh, young cybersecurity professionals try to develop their research and writing experience and display it? especially for potential customers or employers to see. Uh, I think we talked about that before. You said publish, publish your findings, publishing your, your analytical you know, mindset. Like you, 
you, what are what are some sort of publishing ideas that you have in terms of sort of both practicing your writing skills and also showing them to potential players? Yeah, you know, just wherever you can, you know, do your research, put together um, examples of writing, you know, t take the time to do that. Um, but it's usually going to work best when you're able to collaborate with others when you when you get to share this information. So, you know, my suggestion would be to hook up with people that would give you that opportunity, right? That's going to like take the time to read what you've ri written because it's hard to get motivated to, to write stuff if, if, you know, no one's going to read it. Right. Um, so whether that's building networks, uh, uh, people, you know, at, at, in your company or, um, you know, local groups, cause there, there is all that kind of thing, especially in the security industry there, right. we're very welcoming, you know, yeah. At, at, yeah. mentor at, groups and learning. Right. Groups I mean, there's, there's many networks. of these things. Yeah, yes. exactly. You know, you just reach out and, and it's there for you. And that's where I would start practicing these things. But, you know, Chris, I was an English major in college. Yep. Same here. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mm -hmm. saw that. And, and, you know, I find it interesting. I never thought I would find myself in a, a technical job, let alone, yep. you know, info security job. That has served me so well throughout my career. I mean, you end up, you spend so much time writing. And yep. whether that's, you know, these kind of research things um, versus, uh, you know, email communications and, you know, yep. data sheets and you name it, right? Talk, We're writing talking all clients day. down off the ledge and <laughs> all kinds of yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, no, I, all all my friends that were uh, laughed at for being either English or philosophy majors are all uh, doing okay now. <laughs> yeah, so um, I tell everybody if you don't know what you want to be, just yeah. be an English major. It'll translate yeah. later, I promise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nope. We all uh, we all use it. Uh, so again, we're moving to sort of a more abstract concept, curiosity and creativity. Um, you know, on, on one hand, these seem like things that you either have or don't, but I feel like there must be some tips for how to further expand your curiosity or creativity. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, brain training and, you know, sort of, you say, emotional intelligence type things. Do you have any ideas on this? Yeah, this is definitely a, a tough one because, you know, you really got to have a passion for something because I think that is where the curiosity and creativity is derived from it's mm -hmm. it's it's that passion itself and one thing that you'll notice and i think you can talk to anybody in security and you'll get sort of the same answer the people who are best in security you will see that passion they will come with that even if they have no security experience or knowledge they will have this sort of uh passion to learn um to want to know how things work to want to know how to break things Yes. Um, and, and, and that, and that sort of thing. So, you know, I guess the bad news a, a bit to me is that it, it, maybe it just doesn't come naturally to everyone or right. if you don't have a passion for that thing, it's going to be hard to show that, that, you know, e either of those attributes, the curiosity or creativity. Well, that, 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 yeah, once on one side, that's, that's a downside. But on the other hand, I think that represents an upside for people who think, well, I'm not technically minded enough, but I still would like to get into cybersecurity, but I feel intimidated by sort of all the, you know, the networking or all the sort of fiddly diddly doodads or whatever. And, right. you know, I, we've had plenty of guests who have, uh, you know, on the show who have said, you know, I'll, I'll train anyone in the, in the tech of it. I want to see what your problem solving skills are. I want to see what your soft skills are, things like that. Exactly. So um, moving back to sort of skills gap, concepts here because of the speed at which up to the minute knowledge changes in the security game. It's, you know, they say that update knowledge has a half-life of about two years. So about every two years, half the knowledge that you have is no longer, you know, viable. Uh, do you think this issue is bigger than just getting people onto the skills treadmill so that they're staying fresh? Is there, uh, is that ever going to be a thing that, you know, can be sort of um, sped up or accelerated in any way? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's funny I, I think that being on the treadmill is is kind of the point, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, people who are going to do well in this industry, you know, you have a growth mindset. You want to learn every day. You want to have to, you know, keep pushing and learning the, the new techniques and, you know, how things are getting done. And um, if you've got that in mind that, you know, you're going to have a life of learning, uh, these are the types of, of people, again, that will do well in the industry, but that I think 
don't get burnt out in these kinds of situations. Don't yes. feel like it's actually, uh, you know, that it's not an that obligation. It's a, a tread- yeah. yeah, exactly. And then you're on this treadmill, you know, situation. The, the other thing I've noticed over the years, 20 years of doing security is that when, when you go up a layer of abstraction in thinking about the attacks and how they work, it's actually kind of all the same stuff. You know, yes. the classes yeah, of bugs, go. they haven't changed. They're still the same. Right. You know, it's still a buffer overflow attack. It's still a cross-site right. scripting attack. Um, it's, it's kind of the same class of attacks, but maybe different techniques and methods. Yeah. And so depending on what your role is, you know, you actually can keep a pretty current understanding of what's happening in the industry without having to kind of turn over that knowledge every year. Yeah, it's like doing a, a, a malware update, you know, you just, all that, all that new sort of ambient data is just getting sort of soaked in, but you're still doing the same, same things. So um, within your own organization, how do you assess both the real skills gap in your organization, uh, the actual skill level of your staff and the actual skill level of applicants for your infosec positions? Are there questions you should be asking candidates or existing employees to prove their knowledge? We talked about this a little bit with the, uh, you know, sort of demonstrating your problem solving skills, but do you have any other uh, tips to sort of help, you know, HR see, you know, what are examples, you know, cause we, classically HR has a problem of looking for, you know, well, they have the right cert, they have the right, you know, right. point on their resume or whatever, but how do you sort of get past that? Well, you know, I think one way is not so much to ask what you know, but show me how you think. Right. Yep. So you give you give candidates questions. You know, uh, if if I asked you to build Twitter, mm-hmm. how would you go about doing that? Right? Do you build the web app first? Do you build the database in the back for you know the way that mm-hmm. candidates will answer questions like that will get you to understand sort of you know how they think. Um, imagine you've been breached. How are you going to go talk to your you know, your manager about that or the organization about that, right? You kind of give them scenarios and see how they would, you know, sort of go through that. Um, if you were going to conduct a vulnerability assessment, right? Instead of, you know, do you know how to do vulnerability assessments? It's, well, take me through the process. Explain to me, you yeah. know, what those steps are. And that is a, a great way to kind of pull out, pull out that knowledge. We, I always want to do the technical questions. I, I don't think you should miss those. Yeah. Um, I remember one, one of our questions, what's the difference between TCP and UDP, mm-hmm. right? Has to be maybe the most basic networking question there is. Yes. And probably, I mean, since security, you know, a lot of it is based on networking and, you know, how networks work. Um, this would be, you know, very useful information for anybody who's trying to, trying to get into the field. Yeah. And you'd be surprised that you'd look at a resume that looks like it had all the right moves. And then you ask that question <laughs> and the answers you would get. Yeah. And quite honestly, I would always be happy if someone said, you know, I probably can't explain that to you. However, you know, I, I have an analytical mindset and I'm, I, right. I want to learn and I think this stuff is great. Yep. As opposed to someone who doesn't really know, and then they try to start explaining to you what the differences between TCP and UDP. Right. And you know, I they they end up disqualifying themselves immediately. Right. Yeah. Would it be reasonable to say, well, I've never really worked with the distinction between the two, but we can sort of talk further about it, something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And so you you know you're kind of looking for that, I guess maybe a little bit of honesty. You know, yeah, a little humbleness too. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about where companies are looking for candidates. You think it's possible that qualified candidates exist and companies just aren't reaching out to them, especially since you're saying that they don't necessarily have to be IT or tech focused. Is there, are there sort of like untapped sort of wildernesses of uh, potential candidates that uh, we, we don't know are out there or they don't know they're out there maybe? Well, you know, the, the, to answer the question, where are companies finding these people? Yep. They're finding them from other companies. Oh yeah, and sure. That's the problem, right? That's mm-hmm. part of the problem is because Just passing around. As, yeah, as an industry, it's like we're robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? Yep. yep. And and I get it. I mean, I want to do the same thing as a hiring manager because these people are tested, they're proven, they they've shown you know some level of they have some level of experience at, in a real world environment as opposed to getting them from colleges and universities and things like that, you know. I think the college university thing, though, is a really 
it, this has evolved for us. It used to be that no one had a security program. And now there are many, many out yes. there, too many to even mention. And some of them, I think, are doing some good practical hands-on kind of uh, training. And that is directly translatable or applicable to a job in the real world, right? Yes. And so I'm always you know, looking for that and encouraging. Uh, and, and I do get around uh, to different universities at times and talk about their programs to try to get out of the theoretical and get into the hands-on because that's the skills that actually translate for these people as they're moving through. And if you're able to create a, a crop of those kinds of students, that's where we could be looking, right? That's where yeah. we could be getting a lot of these, these folks from, right? Yeah. So, so this, is, this is kind of a weird question. Um, you know, when I ride the bus to work in the morning, I'll see advertisements for other states. I'm in Chicago, and so I'll get see advertisements for Wisconsin or Michigan saying, move to Michigan, move to Wisconsin. And it seems very brash to me, but I'm thinking like, is there a possibility where uh, the cybersecurity industry makes a concerted effort to sort of advertise itself as an interesting and viable career move sort of in other industry publications or locations? Like, Because again, I feel like there's there's needs to be the sort of beating of the bush to sort of find, to let people in other sort of industries know, hey, this might be something you'd be interested in. You have all the qualifications more so than you need. Um, is there any is there any benefit to that or am I a lunatic? No, I think I think you're right on. I think there's an awareness that needs to be developed and and by the way, you know, let's let's make it sound a little, you know, a little sexy, right? right. It's it's it was traditionally I think people think of it as well, you know, I need to be a nerd, right? I need yeah, to be a nerd yeah. to get into the security yeah, industry. office space or whatever, yeah. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's really it's not that at all. Um, but getting that awareness out there, absolutely. And that awareness could even be, I mean, I like your idea about pulling, I mean, literally advertising in these other places and, and yeah. pulling people in. Um, but doing that within your own companies, especially the larger companies, of course, where they've sure. got lots of resources, is I don't think we're tapping into that enough. And again, we may be thinking of, I need the technical skills, the nerd qualities and these yep. kinds of things. Uh, but going back to kind of what the whole talk is about is that there's, people that have these soft skills that are in your organization and you just got to find them. So getting that awareness out within uh, your own org as is probably a good way. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, so we're starting to wind down here a little bit. If you had kind of a, ma a magic wand to, to solve the skills gap once and for all, what would, what would be the combination of actions you would take that would, what's, what's the kind of fast track measures of your dreams that would solve this tomorrow? If any, well, I mean, the most obvious thing, Matt Guand, right? It's was that, sorry, you, criminals, you, right? You, you skipped for a second there. What did you say now? Your, your, I, your I, internet wobbled. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. <laughs> stopping criminals, right? Yes, if right, there were right. no more criminals, yeah, there you go. this wouldn't be a problem. We I know it, yeah. it sounds obvious, right? But that is really, really what it is. And if you could kind of wave your magic wand and remove that problem, then, uh, you know, everything is, is easy. Um, the thing about it is there's, there always, there's always going to be criminals and it ends up being this cops and robbers scenario. And every time, you know, the, the, the cops catch, catch the robbers, the robbers have to figure out, you know, new techniques yep. and it ends up being this, you know, cat and mouse routine that goes on you know forever and and for that i don't feel like there's a there's a great way to solve it i do think though that this is where automation comes in where we have to start leveraging you know the power of automation to to start solving some of this and not have to rely on on humans as much as we do yeah 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 now one of our uh interviews with the cybersecurity analyst who said to move up to manager position automate yourself out of your own job Right. <laughs> yeah, you move move up the next level that way. Uh, so, what are your predictions for the skills gap in twenty twenty? So, we've we've looked at the predictive version of what what you would like. What do you think is actually going to happen uh, between the sort of federal cyber skill, you know, reskilling academy uh, and all this sort of stuff? Where do you see all this going? Do you see the gap widening? Do you see things moving in the right direction? I honestly see the gap widening. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think we can catch up and it's actually just, it's getting worse. You know, okay. I, I think these efforts like the, the, you know, the cyber thing, the reskilling, 
these are good steps and we need to do these things and keep pushing. Um, but ultimately I, I don't think it's going to be fast enough. Okay. So, um, we'll wind up here. Uh, tell me about your work at respond software. What problems are you currently engaged in and solving for your clients? Well, you know, quite frankly, our product is trying to address this problem head on. Okay. This is what we do. I mean, we've essentially built a virtual security analyst. Mm -hmm. Our software uh, emulates the, the judgment, the reasoning of a, essentially a SOC level one analyst, right? The, the guy you have sitting in front of consoles looking at security alerts all day, right? Yep. It's a really tough job. It's hard to find the bad guys in all of those alerts. There's lots of false positives in those alerts. Yep. And getting humans to stare at consoles all day is just not the way it's going to work, right? Um, you're, you're not going to be effective that way. And so we've built software where we've essentially taken, you know, this knowledge, the reasoning skills of a human analyst and built that into software. And what that enables you to do is to move your humans out of that role and put them in the security roles that require yeah. curiosity, creativity, collaboration and communication, yep. the things that machines can't do. And in this way, we might actually make up some of this gap. Because if we can automate the things um, that are taking the most time, and by the way, are not necessarily an efficient way to do it, um, we can free these people up to do the important security projects that you have. Okay, one final question. If people want to know more about Chris Triolo or Respond Software, where can they go online? Yeah, come visit our website. It's respond-software.com. We've got a ton of resources there. Um, we talk all about this and our, our, our product. Uh, so do that. Follow us on LinkedIn. We're always posting, uh, you know, blogs and press releases and those types of things. And that would be a great, great place to find out more about us. All right, Chris, thank you for joining us today. I think this is going to give our, uh, our students and learners a lot to think about. Thank you, Chris. And thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in CyberWork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search CyberWork with InfoSec in your favorite podcast catcher of choice. Uh, to see the current promotional offers available to listeners of this podcast, go to infosecinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Uh, and as we've been saying in previous weeks, uh, we have a free election security training resource uh, used to educate poll workers and volunteers on the cybersecurity threats they might face this election season. For more information on how to download your training packet, visit infosecinstitute.com forward slash IQ forward slash election dash security dash training or click the link in the description. Thanks once again to Chris Triolo and thank you all for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week.